plus any one leg of the divider or trammel. Uh, to use a prick punch, place the 68 included angle of the prick punch in the desired location. Hold the prick punch perpendicular to the punch piece and use a ball pin hammer to tap the prick punch. Okay, somebody else just pick up if you're on the next slide. Just keep rolling. If there's any questions, just say something. Center punches are used to mark the mark made by a prick punch. Center punches are have an included angle of 90 degrees. The mark left by the center punch can be used to drill a hole in the location. To use the center punch, place the point of the center punch in the mark made by the prick punch. Hold the center punch perpendicular to the workpiece and use a ball pin hammer to tap the center punch. Okay, on to protractors. Turn protractors are used to lay a line of bending needle. To use the turn protractor, place the head of the protractor against the workpiece line or edge of the workpiece. Rotate the blade to the desired angle. Describe the line using the blade for bearing. Who wants that gauge? High gauges are used for precision layout tools. Describe the level line. High gauges consist of vernier dial or digital scale to accurately adjust the scriber to desired measurement. Having this built-in scale allows for a more accurate layout than a surface gauge. To use a high gauge, place the high gauge on the surface plate. Secure the workpiece with an appropriate work holding device. Adjust the scriber to desired measurement and pull the scriber along the workpiece. Sign bar. Sign tools are precision layout tools used to describe angles. The sign bar is an accurately machined bar with parallel edges. When you're doing layout work, a sign bar holds the workpiece at a desired angle, and then the height gauge is used to describe a line. You can use a sign bar. Adjust the sign bar to a desired angle. Place the workpiece on the sign bar. Adjust the height gauge to a desired height. Pull the scribe, scribe around the height gauge along the workpiece. Vernier bevel protractor. Sure. Vernier bevel protractors are precision layout tools used to scribe angles with accuracy of one twelfth of a degree. Use a vernier bevel protractor to pull the oh, no, to use a vernier bevel protractor. Hold the base of the protractor against the reference wire edge of the workpiece. Rotate the blade at the desired angle. Describe the line using the blade as a guide. Okay. That's going to take us into the review. Um, we will go ahead and go. Let me see what else we need here. Move on to materials, if I can find it. Okay, I'm going to hop over into materials. We're only doing that one module. Do what? We're only doing that one module on that one. That's all there is on that. Oh. That's the whole layout module. They're honestly fairly short. They're not terrible. So we'll just run through the modules and whatever we get done here, take at least those tests at home or after class. And then you don't have to do the other ones. Um, there's five total we need to do for sure. If we don't get them done today, we can knock them out tomorrow before we go back to the shop. But they should be fairly easy. We'll see how far we can get. So introduction to metals. Somebody take off. Metals are usually classified in multiple major classifications. Ferrous metals, non-ferrous metals, rare metals, and high temperature metals. Metals classified as ferrous or non-ferrous are most commonly used in tuning, making these the two major classifications. Metals that fall under rare or high temperature classifications are less commonly used. They become more popular in many industries, such as aerospace and military, and military research.
classification systems. The unified memory systems are UNS and the world to identify metals or alloys across many industries. Prior to the UNS, almost every industry had their own identification system for metals and com uh, composites compositions. This would lead to confusion. Uh, the UNS has become widely used as a standard in most industries. The UNS designates the letter prefix for a particular type of metal, following the letter prefix of a five-digit number associated with the material comp composition. And then Color coding. Some of you guys in the back, I haven't heard from you. I'll start back there. Um, I cannot find that on my immerse. You can't find it in your immerse? Why didn't you say something like 10 minutes ago? Okay. So, you're in immerse, right? Justin, I may be able to add you. Let me look, but I don't think I have that capability yet. You also want to keep going. I'll see if I can find this. Steel contains 0.5 to 
1.5 carbon percent carbon, which makes it the least flexible of the carbon steels. Applications include springs, wrenches, hammers, screwdrivers, pliers, and much more. Alloy steels contain a combination of two or more elements to make the material stronger, harder, more rigid, etc. Allowing elements such as chromium, nickel, manganese, and tungsten, but yeah, alloying elements such as those are used change the characteristics of the alloy steel. Alloy steels are used in a large variety of applications. Some of these applications include axles, turbine blades, electric motors, gears, bicycles, and much more. The machinability of alloy steels depends on the alloying elements. Most alloy steels become harder to machine, but, lead, uh, but lead can be added to steel, making it easier to machine. American Iron and Steel Institute and SAE are the standard organizations that created and designed the system that was commonly used to identify plain carbon steel and or plain carbon and alloy steel. The agency's um, designation system typically uses four digit numbers to identify most steels. The first two digits indicate the steel is made up of certain alloy element. The last two digits specify the carbon in the hundred percent. Alloy steel is identified with five digits have carbon content over one percent. The letter L in the middle of identification numbers means the steel contains lead. The letter B means it contains boron. Tools steels can contain alloying elements that allow them to be used for molds, dies, punches, and cutting tools. Tool steels are most often stronger than plain carbon or alloy steels. Alloy steels are a form of steel which have a minimum chromium content of 2% and sometimes referred to as the non-resting steel. They are resistant to corrosion and rust and so Tungsten carbide is made up of the chemical compound containing equal parts tungsten and carbon atoms. The process of producing it is known as sintering. During this process, tungsten, carbon, and cobalt are molded under heat and pressure. Tungsten carbide is stiffer and denser than steel and is the hardest human made metal. Aluminum alloys are metal that contain a combination of aluminum and other alloying elements. Alloying elements that are often used include zinc, copper, and silicon. Aluminum alloys are classified as either wrought or cast. Wrought aluminum is shaped by physical forging, rolling, extruding, hammering, or other mechanical techniques. Cast aluminum is shaped by pouring molten aluminum into the mold. And then aluminum alloys are soft, not very strong, but easy to machine. Magnesium alloys. Magnesium alloys are similar to aluminum alloys, however, they are lighter and stronger. They are the lightest of all the structural metals and have a high strength to weight ratio. To use magnesium alloys is easy, but great caution should be taken. These alloys make chips that are highly flammable. Whenever you use water based cutting tools or machines in these alloys, because water causes magnesium to ignite and become unstable. Alloy steel is Copper based alloys include, but are not limited to, grass and rock. Grass is mostly an alloy of copper and zinc, stronger and more corrosion resistant than pure copper. Bronze is mostly an alloy of copper and tin, stronger than brass and highly wear resistant. Titanium alloys have a high, very high tensile strength, strength and toughness in extreme temperatures. Lightweight, very strong, and corrosion resistant titanium alloys are an excellent material for many applications. These alloys are expensive and are not easy to machine. Super alloys are made, of, are made up of a nickel based metal that stand up in very extreme conditions. These alloys exhibit several characteristics excellent mechanical strength, resistance to thermal creep in the formation good surface stability and resistance to corrosion. Super alloys are extremely hard to machine.
Okay, that is the materials module. Um, let's see here. Do what? Do, are we only doing the introduction to metals, or we got, do we got to do the, uh, the workpiece materials and, and machinability and the exam and all that? that covers the same. So, what did I get in here? Oh, is there more? Yeah, there's, yeah. Oh, my bad. I wonder if there's any other down here. There might be. There was someone describing. Uh, was there? The, the layout okay. Well, we can continue with this one, then we'll go back and grab that one real quick. Yep, you're right. There's a lot more. That's really not too terribly much. Nine, ten slides. <coughs> So standard material groups include six different types of materials, the unique properties of each group affect uh, machine ability and setups that result in different needs. In the cutting tool, each group is identified by the different letter area. The six different groups are P, steel, M, stainless steel, finished off frame, and aluminum, S, heat resistant, super alloys, and H, heavy material. Machine ability. Term the workpiece machine ability set the factors into different parts. Workpiece material classification, metallurgy, mechanical, and micro and macro geometry of cutting edge can be used in the cutting tool material. Once the cutting for a series of letters and numbers, you need to identify the workpiece material properties and characteristics. The micro term is supposed to be used referring to the same thing. I don't know if we have that guide anywhere. I'm sure we do, but I don't know where. Steel is used throughout the machine industry and is the most widely used for this material. In machining steel, the material generally leaves long chips in order to continuous, relatively even flow of chip formation. Carving content can, can dictate vari variations. Low carbon materials typically tough and sticky, high carbon materials get easier. The cutting force and power needed to machine steel is different every part and varies minimally. Machinability decreases with higher alloy contents and hardness. Stainless steel are commonly used throughout the following applications gas and oil, tubes, bondages, pharmaceuticals. Machining stainless steel results in an irregular chip formation as the cutting force forces required are higher than the standard steel. Stainless steel is available in many types, many different types. Depending on the alloying elements and heat treatment, chip breaking range ranges from easy to difficult. Cast iron components are one of the common automotive applications. Machine building and higher level productions. Chip formation for cast iron materials is very, very from spiral like chips to very long, very long chips. Ray cast iron is often chiral like, while ductile iron has a chip weight and is more consistent with that of steel. The main material group requires low amount of power. Aluminum components are hardly found in aircraft applications and automotive wheels. Aluminum can be machined with low power. However, it is still recommended to try to the maximum power. Heat resistant super alloys are used in the following industries aerospace, gas turbines, power generators. Heat resistant super alloys are difficult to machine and typically require high cutting force. Mine froze just a second ago. It took a minute, but it came back. Hard materials can be found in a wide range of industries, such as automotive, machine builders, and die and mold makers. Chip formation of machining hard materials often results in continuous wet flow in the chip. Have you all ever seen something get really hot while it's machining? Yeah, and I cut off too many times. I've got some videos from out there. We get some messing around, and we like had a fire in the lathe. 
Very great. Maybe some of that. Uh, Yeah, it's a good modifier the whole time. Yeah. Okay, is that it, or is there more? Yeah, let's hop back over to layout, knock it out, then we'll have two done. Yeah, this isn't going to take very long at all. So we'll for sure get through at least one or two more. A layout safety, there you go. Important safety rules to remember. You burn and move sharp edges of work piece before beginning layout work. Always read the manufacturer's precautions when using layout guides. Never place fragment tools in your pockets. Place a protective cover on sharp points when tools are not in use. Angle plate, surface plate, and V blocks can be very heavy in lifting. Get help and with precaution. Always wear eye protection. Layout steps. Each layout job will be different, but the general layout steps should help you understand the overall process of laying out a job. Read all the layout and shop safety rules before beginning. Cut the workpiece to its desired size. Deeper the workpiece and remove all sharp edges. Read the part print and determine what the layout tool will be needed. Gather the necessary, necessary layout tools. Clean the workpiece so it's free of any debris. Apply a layout guide. Describe reference lines to make other measurements off of the tools, edge, and points of use. Locate the center points of circle parts and holes. Mark those locations with a foot punch. Use a divider or a trimmer to describe all circles and arcs. Use the appropriate layout tool to describe all lines and linear lines. That should be all pretty repetitive. You guys have already done some layout, so. Do we need to watch a video on how to apply DICOM? Unless we're waste time, yes. I mean, <laughs> I don't know how much time it's going to waste, but we can totally watch it. Absolutely. All right, we're going to watch it. Should you all watch it at the same time? Okay, 30 next seconds. The procedure is using DICOM to glue up our part. This one is a felt uh, tip. Uh, bottle here so it keeps the fill down. I find that this is a lot neater. So take out the, the cap. The, uh, all you have to do is flip it upside down, give it a little squeeze, and uh, just like you're using a big marker. So it goes apart. Stuff dries real nice and quick. And uh, we'll put the cap back on. And we'll take a few seconds out for it to dry. That was necessary. Yep, that totally was necessary. necessary. On to the next one. Uh, I did another one. So much. Oh, do you all want to watch how to scribe lines? Yes. I'm already here, so let's do it. I hope it's the same guy. Oh, six minutes. An exercise on laying out lines, making cross points for hole locations, radiuses, and what the tools we're going to be using today, we're going to be using the height gauge, we're going to be using radius gauges, uh, radius gauge set looks like this, and uh, we have all types of different sizes for the radiuses. Um, we are going to be using a divider, just like a, a compass. We also are going to be using center punches. Do the center punch and um, and a hammer, of course, to use that. And before we get started, I'd like to uh, give you a couple little ideas on when you're doing a layout. I like to do all my math work first. I like to get all the location set, put it on paper, so I can set my height gauge. You now you can do things more rapidly, get things more flowing. Also, we, uh, I like to use a datum point on uh, all my uh, parts. So if you even pick any bottom corner, it's up to you. But once you choose it, you're going to be going off of the two sides only. You don't rotate all the way around, make more confusion, more mistakes. So I guess the good way to, to set your datum is to take a scriber, and I like to maybe scratch the corner so I know that that's the side I'm going to use as a datum. I'm set the corner. Okay, so the first thing we're going to look at my dimensions, and the first one is 750,000 from the bottom because it calls for a three quarter radius. So, the radius, how those work is anywhere on that radius of 750,000. So, on my height gauge here, I'm going to set this zero up to the 700. Do we and this one goes by the 50,000 increments, so I'm just going to do what? Do we have height gauges? I don't know if there are 
Yeah, they're not going to be in your box. We showed a couple out there. Justin actually was showing us a cool little one earlier before class. So we do have a few. But does the go off one corner thing make sense to you guys? Yes. Always reference the one corner. Everything will line up so much better. It'll make your work a lot easier. Anything else? Good. Before I start this mind numbing video again. Ours is part. digital, so none right of that crap. Part, firmly. Uh, you can go from side to side. I'm just going to do a smaller line just across the bottom without going to each side. Okay, so there's our first line. There's going to be six points on this part. There's going to be basically three points going up, and then I'm going to flip it and have three points going the other way. So I did my math. It's asking for a three quarter plus two and a half, so that's three and a quarter. I'm going to bring it up to three inches, 250. Bring up the zero to the 300, the two. And then the line way back to the two is 250. I'm going to try and adjust that in again. This is pretty uh, no accurate work. You can't, can't have that line above or below the amazing line there. So you've got to keep it real, real exact. Okay. So three, no, so I already made the two. I'm going to put the three in the door. I'm going to start going to, listen, I said it's not exactly right on that. Okay, so three, three inches, 250. So that's the actual size right there. This one is a little wider. I'm going to make this one go across the part. Pretty much like that. It doesn't have to fall off the edge. So there's our second rotation. And then lastly, I have, I have to add another three eighths on top of that. So when you take Three and a quarter and add three eighths, that's three. You'll see how he's moving the gauge and not the part. Five that gauge is precision ground on the bottom. And on that surface plate, you're going to get a more accurate line across versus moving your part. That's just rough stock. So always move the gauge. I'm going to try and adjust that 25 in to the next line that it lines up with. And there it is. You can double check that the zero and it's three inches, 6.5. Okay, I'm going to describe that line. I'm going to make it a little bit shorter. You'll see the, what we're doing once you see the print. Okay, so there's my three lines here. Now we're going to use our datum corner. I'm going to turn this thing, rotate it on its side. I've got three points that I've got to describe across. First one that calls for, a, it's got a radius on the end of 5 eighths. So 5 eighths is 625. I'm going to draw it back down to the 600. Again, using locking it down using the fine adjustment, I find the 25,000 from the scale and I'm going to line it up to the, the next line that it lines up with. That's how the burning scale works. You just always go to the next. You get as close as you can, go up to the next line. Okay, I'm just going to cross this line right here. It's going to be a whole location. Okay. You can, like I said, describe them all the way across, but then it starts looking kind of like a big graph and it can get confusing. I wonder where your points are supposed to be. Next one, I'm adding one and three quarters to five eighths. Okay, that'll be three point, or that'll be two point three seven five. Let's go up to two point two seven five. Again, we'll go up to the three fifty. That's as close as we can get it on the main scale. Lock it in, find twenty five, line it up to the next line that we've got. Okay, there it is. This whole location is down here at this cross line. So there's our, our second whole location. The third one's going to be up here. It's a symmetrical looking layout. So now i got to add another one and three quarters. And that'll be four and one eighth, or 4.125. Bringing the zero up to the four and the 100. Locking it in, finding the 25, lining up to the next line that we see. Double check it, it looks like 1.25, so 4.125. Come across, bring it nice and steady, bring it across. Now we can bring it back to the beginning. Here's our three holes that will be eventually drilled or laid out. Okay, so now, next thing we'll be doing is using the dividers to 
put in our radiuses and our hole locations. Or put, we'll, we'll simulate a drilled hole by setting a divider to uh, a half inch, or we're going to set it for a quarter to swing a, a half inch hole. I'll leave that in just a little bit. Yes. Oh, the next page. You guys want to sleep yet, or you need another Setting, one to fall asleep? I think I'm going to rewatch all of this later on. Before I we might as well just continue on. It's another six minutes. The next step in our layout project, we're going to put the radiuses in, and we're going to center punch the center of these, these uh, marks. And also, we're going to put kind of a simulated hole size in there, too. We're not going to drill the hole, but we're just going to make it look like the size drill is supposed to be in there. So first of all, we're going to use uh, the center punch, and with the center punch, you just kind of find the X, try to get as close as you can. So he's doing the same thing we did with the center right, except we were more accurate. So go around the heart with the next thing. You can do it this way. That's a different yeah. center punch. Then, we're gonna set That's a the next thing we're gonna use is self divider. We're punching. We're using the divider. This is what sets our it's spring loaded. Uh, radius. And now what so if it calls for a three quarter radius, we have to set this for exactly three quarters of an inch. I'm gonna start with the number one here, the, the one on the scale, which kind of catches, so you have a little scribe line there, so it catches easier. Just slide it down, bring it right to the three quarter mark. Once it's set, now I have to look at the print. It calls for the three quarter down here. These are five eighths, so I don't want to mix those up. Now I just put this on the mark. And the radius, you could bring it right up to this line. It would be okay practice to do for now. So I'm going to swing that around. Sometimes we've got too many crosshairs here to get these things just right. It's also a little clue to know that you're doing it right is if it touches the very bottom. You know that if you set this for three quarters of an inch with the height gauge, and you set this at three quarters, it should be right on the, the edge. The next one's going to be calling for a five eighths radius on both sides. So I put it back on the number one again. And I crank it into the five eighths mark on the scale. That's set. Now I can start over here. Lock it in. Same distance from here. Doesn't really matter how far you go. You can make full circles if it makes you happy, but I like to try to kind of take it where, where the print shows. There's this one for the five eighths. Second one, swing it around. You'll probably want to do this on your tap pad. There is a lot of holes, so. It just kind of checks you and helps you know, hey, this is the right drill bit, so you don't go in with one too big, no, thinking also, it's for the other hole. That way, you know, like, hey, it should match up with this line. The then you'll know. The best thing to do, I find, is just using a nice straight edge, doesn't have any nicks or scratches in it. And run that thing right to the outside of that radius and the outside of this radius. You can use your scriber, too, to kind of put it on the line and bring it up to it. Come over here, put the line up to it. For a nice radius, you really want to match these lines up or for a nice look on your layout part. I'm going to just scribe it by hand right up to the lines it needs. Either way, so there's our first connected line. Same thing over here. Bring the scriber up. Scrap it in. There's our, our basic shape now coming in. Now there's a couple little details that's calling for. There's, uh, well, you know what, before we go too far, let's, let's put in the, the half inch hole. So to get a half inch, half inch hole or a diameter, we have to go half of that for a radius. So we got to put this back on the number one. I'm going to bring this. To a quarter of an inch. Gabe, you have all of these different points. These are all three sixteenths. And you think 
your gauge. So this is your radius these gauge. All these different points of, these are all three sixteenths. Anything, like any area, area that has a squeak to it, it's all the same. So it's kind of like, what do you want to you know, choose your, choose your, uh, your preference there? If you want to go this way, you want to use uh, this, the sweetest, really can do whatever is most comfortable for you. So I'm going to use this one right here. It's not much of a and you won't see a big difference, but it adds a little detail to it. So all of the little in. arcs on that one gauge are all the same measurement. So it's got multiple different yeah, sides you can use. Uh, a lot of times you won't always see the little detail in that, but it's, but it's there. Okay, so that kind of completes our, our little layout assignment here. I hope you guys don't want to watch this one. I mean, if you do, I'll totally play it. No. Y'all must be falling asleep finally. Okay. I think that's it for that one. Yeah. Are you seriously watching it in the middle video? <laughs> We're going to go to reading blueprints real quick and knock that one out. Just trying to do the ones that will get you all started on your next project. Is it a long one? Oh, that's not terrible. Apparently this one's going to talk to you. Does anybody have any print reading experience from welding or anything? Yeah. So some of this is similar? Okay. Okay, on to our module. Of 
Is the video working or do you all want to read my loud? What's that? Are you all fine listening to it or do you want to read it or? I'm just making sure I see some glazed eyes out there. ISO standards. ISO stands for International Organization for Standards. The International Organization for Standards was established in 1946 with the goal of creating universally accepted drawing standards. The standards originally developed by this committee have been adopted by most countries with little or no modification. That's fine. Yeah, if y'all don't want to click through your slides, that's fine since we're just watching. Do what? Do you have to take the, I think you have to go through the slides to take pre-test. No, you take the pre-test before you go through the slide. Do you really? Yeah, you gotta take the pre-test. It, it just sees what you know before you even look at the material. Oh. So if you look at the material beforehand, they can... I guess who's letting me skip the pre-test then? I guess, I don't know. We'll just keep going. Um, just follow the board. Two prints will show different two dimensional views of a part in order to describe it. The reader of the blueprint should be able to visualize a three dimensional object using these different two dimensional views. Orthographic projection. Orthographic projection is a concept of describing a part by using multiple two-dimensional views. These two-dimensional views are systematically laid out in the blueprint, relative to each other. There are six views that can be used. Top, bottom, front, rear, left, and right. So you will probably see questions on this one. It's going to ask your views a lot and the types of views. So... We'll watch that one. Uh, this one too, probably. First angle projection. First angle projection is a projection method used with ISO. Look for the proper identifying symbol to know when first angle projection is being used. This method of projection is primarily used only in Europe and Asia. First angle projection places the principal view, which is typically the front view, in the center of the drawing. The right view is placed on the left of the principal view. The bottom view is placed above the principal view. The top view is placed below the principal view. The left view is placed to the right of the principal view. The rear view is placed to the right of the principal view. And right of the left view is present. So that all makes sense? is a projection method used with ANSI. Look for the proper identifying symbol to know when third angle projection is being used. This method is used in North America and many countries around the world. Third angle projection places the principal view, which is typically the front view, in the center of the drawing. The right view is placed to the right of the principal view. The bottom view is placed below the principal view. The top view is placed above the principal view. The left view is placed to the left of the principal view. The rear view is placed to the left of the principal view. And left of the left view is present. Multiple view drawings. Drawings can use one, two, or three views to describe a part. Drawings should not include a view if that view does not give any relative information. One, two, and three view drawings should include all the information needed about the shape and size of the part. Many drawings will include an isometric view, which shows the object at a 45 degree angle to the horizontal and angled down about 35 degrees. This view is available to help visualize the part. Isometric views do not count as one of the multiple views because it should not be used to display size. One view 
moment. Worms and drawings are sufficient for simple parts that don't have special features that would require more ease. Typically, one view drawings are used for flat or turned objects. The three dimension of one view drawings will be expressed by symbols and notes. A hey, chance, what kind of drawings that? What type of drawing did we just go over? One view. Two view drawings. Two view drawings, which consist of two adjacent views, are sometimes needed to clearly describe the shape of a part. Cylindrical objects can often be fully described by using two view drawings. are sometimes necessary to fully describe a part. These drawings will include top, front, and side views. Section views. Section views allow for interior features to be shown by slicing the part. The designer will make an imaginary cut on the part with a section line, which creates a cutting plane. A section view is put on the drawing to display the interior of the part, which is cut away. Engineering Drawings Blueprint When a design engineer creates an original drawing from an idea, that drawing is known as an engineering drawing. That engineering drawing then gets copied. This copy is known as a blueprint. Engineering drawing blueprint. There are two main types of blueprints, detailed drawing and assembly drawing. There are also other types of blueprints, such as process drawings, that will not be discussed in this course. drawings provide all necessary information for the production of a part. Detailed drawings should include the shape description, size description, and all specifications of a part. Shape description. Shape description is the actual drawing of the part. Shape description may consist of multiple views to help visualize the finished part. the identification of size and location for each feature on a part. Specifications. Specifications can usually be found in the title block or other places on the drawing and include such information as the bill of materials, notes, surface finish information, and tolerances.
are five standard paper sizes. Size A, eight and a half by 11 inches. Size B, 11 by 17 inches. Size C, 17 by 22 inches. Size D, 22 by 34 inches. Size E, 34 by 44 inches. Sections of a blueprint. Every blueprint may not be created equal, but they all have two basic parts. A section for the drawing template and a section for the title block. All standard blueprints will have a large area for the drawing and a title block in the lower right hand corner. Blueprint template. The template section is quite self-explanatory. It is the large open area on the blueprint page where the graphics representing the objects to be manufactured is placed. Blueprint template. Depending upon how complex a part is, the template can have a single view for a simple part, or it can have multiple views for a more complex part. Print notes. Around the drawings in the template section, there are two different types of notes relaying different information. A, general notes. Located directly above the title block, these notes include information that applies to the whole drawing. B, local notes. Using leader lines to designate the area of interest, these notes usually identify specific information about that particular area or object being pointed to. Title block introduction. Title blocks can differ greatly from blueprint to blueprint, but normally they are pre-printed making it rare for a drafter to construct their own. As previously noted, title blocks are located in the lower right-hand corner of the blueprint. There are many provisions one can include in a title block, and how it is arranged is optional. A title block should always include the provisions on the following pages. Drawing number. This field contains the drawing number that identifies the part in the drawing. Any single part can have many drawings applying to that specific part. There can also be multiple drawings to represent different stages of processing or assembling that part. Each drawing will have its own unique identifying number. Title or part name. This field should include the name or the title of the product drawn on the blueprint. It should also include the product number to identify the specific part. Product numbers are controlled numbers used to correctly identify the part. Scale. This field contains the information that identifies the size of the drawing and its comparison to the actual size of the manufactured part. Not all drawings are to scale. So it is important to remember that measurements must be followed if they are written. Bill of materials. This field includes materials to be used for manufacturing in Elizabeth. This can include materials such as steel, aluminum, wood, plastic, etc. Approval date. Before manufacturing can begin, the drawings have to be approved by management quality control. This 11 to 1, actually, when you guys are done with this class, in the quad area, in that kind of that open area in the middle of school, um, free lunch today. There's also scholarships available, some job opportunities, some other stuff. So go over there, grab lunch. I have no clue what it is. Could be Cheerios, I'm not. Um, but go grab lunch and check out some of that other stuff. So. Enjoy. I've got one that still needs an immersive. What's that? I've got one that still needs an immersive for one on one. Her? Chance. She's Sh in. Chance. Yes. He's got 105. She's got 105. I don't have authorization to have him. I tried. Thank you. 
revision method. All item blocks should include a revision table noting the revision level has changed their name to grid 1. Regardless of the simplicity or complexity of the changes made to a part, a new revision level is assigned for that new drawing. Placing revision levels makes it possible to trace the part that has been produced from that particular drawing. Revisions are an important thing to watch, not necessarily so much here, but once you get out to a shop, check your program number to your print always. If it's the wrong revision, it can throw you off, and that will not be good. These are probably all going to be on the quiz. These lines are one thing they normally cover pretty hard. Different ones. Hidden lines. Hidden lines identify surfaces, edges, or corners of an object that are hidden behind other elements of the object. Hidden lines are thin, equally dashed lines. Does everybody see how that one works? In your top view up there, you can see where the line goes in, and then the little red dotted line. It's just showing you what's the inside feature of that part. Symmetry lines. Symmetry lines are used when half a symmetrical object is drawn. Symmetry lines are center lines <coughs> two thick parallel lines crossing perpendicular to them at each end. Did that one make sense? I think it's just going to mirror across. Thank you. 
attention. Conventions or values used to communicate desired size and location are geometric characteristics. The size and location of characteristics are essential for precisely producing parts. I'm going to run through some of these without the little clip so we get through them a little faster. You get your size dimensions here. Size dimensions get values for three characteristics of a part depth, height, and width. Pretty basic. Um, depth, of course, that one's pretty obvious. You can see there you've got your 0.578, and that's just the depth of that center feature. Height will be your outside lines over here. Again, really simple. You all have already seen some prints. Width, same thing, just a little opposite. Um, diameter dimensions, we've had that on our prints already. If any y'all got any questions, just stop me. I'm just trying to get us through it before class runs out. Uh, radius dimensions, those can be on either inside or outside, depending on where they want to put the leader line. Same thing. They will have an R value most of the time. It will say R, so you know it's a radius. Um, angular dimensions, we've seen a few of those. Um, the second way is a linear dimension, so you have to find the angle yourself there. Datum dimensioning uh, is when each feature is dimensioned from a common origin as, or a known datum. So that's like the print you'll have for your uh, tap guide. It's done as a datum. Everything's off that one corner. Location dimensioning, kind of the same thing, just gives you a little more information. Um, I'll play this one. Credit fasteners. Credit fasteners are represented in three ways. Simplified representation is the least detailed and is used whenever it will display all necessary information. Detailed representation is quite detailed and is utilized in showing dimensions in assembly. Schematic representation is the equivalent to detailed representation. However, it is easier to draw. Um, threaded fasteners, there are two dimensioning standards for threaded fasteners, and that is American National Standard and Unified. That is your two types of threads we'll mainly deal with. There's a chart there for the coarse fine, extra fine, different pitches. Calculating dimensions, uh, there are rules that disallow over dimensioning, thus rules make it so dimensions may have to be calculated using given dimensions. Most calculations are made by simple shot math. So what that's saying is there's multiple ways to call out certain dimensions on a part. It's not going to let you give that dimension in two different places. You want to keep your prints clean, you'll get into printmaking and CAD and stuff like that. And it will only, like, once it's all laid out, it's going to say, hey, you need 12 dimensions. And once you hit that 12 dimensions, it's not going to let you put any more. So it will not let you overdimension it. To keep it nice and clean, doesn't let you get confused. So there's not like you know, multiple sizes, one goes up and the bottom goes down. Like right, yeah. just like that. I mean, it just makes it look clean and easier to read, is all that does. See, so like on this top one here on the left, you know your overall is one inch. You know this is half inch, and these are both A. Simple math. Subtract and divide. So you may have to do some work, but it makes it a little simpler. Um, drawing scale. Drawing cannot always be drawn to the exact size. This is why most drawings are scaled larger or smaller as needed. So on your T-slot cleaner, your T-slot cleaner on the picture was not the same size as what it came out as. Every once in a while you will get lucky and it will work out that way, but not very often. Uh, full scale drawing, which is your actual size, like I just said, it may work out like that sometimes. That is a one to one scale. It means everything is exact, one to one. Your reduced scale is objects that are drawn smaller than the actual size. 
So that means whatever's on the paper is going to be smaller than what the part is. And that is a one, up to a one to four. Um, and large uh, objects are drawn larger than the actual size. So that reverses it. That's a four to one. So that means the part you're making is four times the size of the drawing. Try and squeeze this last one in here. Let's look real quick. Yeah, we can do this one. Tolerance skills. Understanding the need for tolerances, knowing the types and identifying the symbols. Identifying tolerances located on engineering drawings. Implement two methods of detailing tolerances. And understand tolerance characteristics and terms. Um, let's see. In part drawings, geometric tolerances are dimensions and symbols used to specify maximum variation of part characteristics. Uh, manufacturers are required to hold a tolerance to produce parts within upper and lower limit tolerances. Um, tolerances are needed since parts cannot be manufactured exact every time. Tolerances are used to define allowable error or var variations that ensure functional requirements such as correct fit and size and shape. Okay. Um, tolerance values, specifically the width or diameter of the tolerance, a point, line, or surface of a feature will have to lie within this tolerance zone. The tolerance zone permits allowance for variation in form for a part feature. In this example, the line has a tolerance of plus or minus five thousandths inches. If the line remains within the tolerance zone, it is intolerance. Does that make sense? So you've got plus 5, minus 5, it's 10 total. As long as it stays in there, it's good. Um, this is an angular tolerance. You won't see many of those. Perpendicularity. Um, again, I'll have to be 90 degrees, whatever. This is parallelism, same thing. Um, there are a variety of terms and symbols used in ge geometric tolerancing. These terms and symbols are used to communicate important specifications on features to ensure that part will be manufactured to required form. So types of tolerances include form, profile, orientation, location, and runout. And it's going to freeze again. What? Yeah. So while we're waiting on this tonight or today or something before class tomorrow, the two tests for the modules we've done, get them knocked out. If you can finish this, if you have time, knock it out. Go through the rest of the slides, finish it. It should be fairly easy. Then we will knock out the other two. Some. Um, your drill box or where are they are? No, we do not have class Monday. It is Labor Day. So, no class. Um, tolerance skills, tolerance type, characteristics and symbols. Each tolerance type category is compromised of characteristics. Um, this is a form tolerance. Its characteristic is roundness. And its symbol is a circle. They make it like super idiot proof. Um, here's some more symbols. Of course, roundness. Cylindricity is your roundness with a line on either side, kind of at an angle. Uh, flatness is, I believe that's a parallelogram. And straightness is just a line. Here's a couple more. A profile on a line is kind of like an upside down half 
moon you kind of thing. And then a profile on a surface is like a circle cut in half on its side. Um, angular is like a small, like a 45 degree angle. Perpendicular and parallel, those should be something everybody probably already knows. Um, position, think of it as like a scope crosshair. You're going to position it somewhere. Concentricity, you'll have two circles kept like perfectly spaced in between each other. Um, and symmetry is three lines with the center being just a little longer than the outer two. Um, your circular runout, you won't see a lot of runout tolerances, but your circular is a dot with an arrow at an angle beside it. And then your total runout for like end to end of a part is two arrows connected with that dot. Uh, basic dimension, there's a little dimension block there, a datum feature called out by a letter. So you may say, like it'll say, check datum A for a certain dimension, and you'll find the A. Um, datum target, that's got a little tolerance with the datum. Least material condition is a circle with an L, maximum circle with an M. Projected tolerance zone, a circle with a P. Super basic. Um, feature control frame is used to divide tolerancing characteristic symbols into compartments including geometric toler tolerance symbol, geometric tolerance value, primary datum, geometric characteristic, and feature tolerance. So this is going to be used when you've got, say, uh, a through hole or a threaded hole or something, and there's a lot of information to throw out on your print. To clean it up, they put it all in one block, connect the leader line to it, and they move it off to the side. That's all that is. It's still the same stuff. It's just in a block. Um, control frames are read left to right. So in number one, you've got your geometric tolerance symbol. Number two, your tolerance value. Three, your datum. Four, your characteristic. And five, your tolerance. Um, in this sample drawing, the symbols in the feature control frame specify the following. So number one, of course, that is your symbol for angularity. Two is your tolerance value of two thousandths. It will be located at datum C. Um, it has a call out for flatness, and its modifier is 1,000th. Um, there it's just showing you a basic print with some tolerances and stuff. Um, this is a, an example of direct tolerancing. Um, this method of tolerancing can be used to specify tolerances or various characteristics of a part, such as lengths, angles, diameters, and location. Um, direct tolerancing can be expressed in different ways, such as limit tolerances, bilateral, unilateral, or single limit tolerancing. Um, direct tolerancing is very common in a lot of the prints you will see. Um, here's another one. When direct tolerance is expressed as a limit tolerance, the maximum and minimum size of the part feature is shown on the dimension. So this is a direct tolerance, so it's calling out that direct dimension. And it's not telling you the exact, but it tells you this is the maximum it can be, this is the minimum. It has to be between those two. That's all that's showing there. Um, single limit tolerances. Uh, when a direct tolerance is expressed as single limit, single limit tolerances, the unspecified limit can be reached, can reach either zero or infinity. Angles, lengths, diameters, and locations may all be expressed as single limit tolerances. So this is saying it is a 250 thou tolerance to place max. So up to 250 thou. Bilateral tolerancing, which is probably your most common, um, allow variation in both directions as noted. Um, you see there, it says 275 plus or minus 3. That means it goes the exact same, either direction, plus 3, minus 3, whatever it may be. Uh, unilateral is kind of similar. You'll see it sometimes. That is a either plus 0 or minus 0. 
So it's only got a, a variance on one side. So it'd be like plus one, minus zero, minus zero, plus two, something like that. Tolerance accumulation. Uh, tolerances are cumulative when more than one tolerance controls the position of a surface in any one direction. When tolerances are cumulative, it is vital to consider the effect of each tolerance in respect to other tolerances. There are three different methods that are acceptable for dimensioning a cumulative tolerances. Chain, datum, and direct. Y'all get what it means when it says cumulative? So think of it as stacking, like blocks. If you got a gauge block and it's a quarter inch plus or minus 10 thou, and then you've got a half inch and say you're only trying to hit three quarter, those tolerances can stack up. So you could easily blow it out if you've got plus or minus 10 on both blocks. So you've got to think about, hey, I need to go a little smaller on this block so this one lines up. Does that make sense? Um, this here kind of shows it. Same thing here. It's just kind of showing you some more examples. Coordinate location tolerances. Here we go. Um, is a standard method for tolerancing the location of holes and other part features. This method defines the center location of a hole in relationship to the surface. So this drawing here, it goes off one location, the center of your little, your biggest hole here, 500 thou up, one inch over. It's going to mark the center of that hole. That's where you would center punch it and drill at. Um, block tolerances uh, reference a dimension to a tolerance block located in the title block. This method of tolerancing can be used to specify tolerances for various characteristics of parts. Um, this is like what you saw on your last on your T slot cleaner. You know, in the box it said for two decimal places, ten thou, three, twenty, just like that. So you're, it'll make your part a little cleaner, be more of just a picture with some main dimensions that won't be tolerance because they will be down in the block. That's just another example there. Linear, same thing. Okay. Let's go ahead and call it there. Where are we at? Actually, that's the last little section. You all want to just run through it real quick? Be done with it? Okay. So, fit introduction. When two parts are assembled, the relationship between them with respect to the amount of clearance or interference presents the fit between the two mating parts. You have three types, clearance, interference, and transition. Clearance fit is a fit which results in limit size that guarantee clearance between the assembled mating parts. So here you have a hole that can be no smaller than 493 and no larger than 560. And your pin to fit is 493 to 440. So that's saying the maximum size of that pen is no larger than the minimum size of this hole. Make sense? So it will be tight, but it will fit. A interference fit is between mating parts who have limits of size which cause interference when they may be assembled. So that's saying that it's going to allow for your hole to maybe be too small or your pen to be too big for those same things to fit together. Should be the last slide here. It's going to load. Transition fits are fits in which mating parts have limits that cause partial or whole overlap, resulting in either a clearance or interference fit in the assembly. So, kind of the same thing, but um, like this one, you've got your max size of your shaft, which is. Uh, 805, 8, 850 thousandths and four tenths, um, and your shaft tolerance is 0 0.0008. So it's just same thing. It's going to be a little off. It just doesn't have to be one or the other. It can be both. I think that's it. Yeah. So knock out those three tests tonight, and we will try and get in the shop tomorrow.
Depending on what Justin's going on, we may come in and grab those other two modules first. We'll see. If you've got your T-slot cleaner, bring them up. I will try and get them graded tonight. 